Thanks for everybody who uh, stayed up late at the bar with us last night to come up with segment ideas for today. There's a lot of creative people, and we're going to put them all to work. So we'll get started here. Um, look, I know on the show that we do, uh, again, on MLB Network, uh, Clubhouse Confidential, uh, we make sure that our main guests are the general managers or the assistant general managers, the guys who are, as we know here, the true superstars of the game. Uh, these, are the, the, this, these are the brains of the outfit um, and the guys who have enormous responsibility. Uh, I, you know, I think we all feel uh, this way about it. It's the coolest job in maybe the world, uh, but it's an extraordinarily difficult job. Uh, and there's so much uh, pressure and there's, uh, there's so many decisions. And now as we see, there's so much information out there and it's so competitive. So these guys, yeah, the, it takes a lot of survival skill, takes a lot of brains, a lot of uh, evolutionary thinking, and these guys have found themselves to be at the very top. So let's bring them up right now. And again, we'll have a, a question and answer, and I'll talk to them for a little Jeff. while, but um, think of your questions that you want to ask them. Uh, keep your questions succinct so we can get a bunch of them going. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for these guys because there's, there's a lot to talk about. So let's first bring up, he was uh, just promoted to this position in the off season. He was a vital part of the White Sox organization in the front office as an assistant GM and an assistant general manager for the 2005 World Series championship team, the general manager of the Chicago White Sox, Rick Hahn. Rick, thanks for doing a little business yesterday and give us something to talk about. We can talk Chris Sale in a moment. Did you want to get that done like yesterday so you could talk today and have this uh, all free? Yeah. <laughs> Say, look, I got a conference. I got to give something to these people, right? <laughs> uh, our next general manager he is a former GM of the San Diego Padres. He was part of the Boston Red Sox front office as a, an assistant GM, among other positions that he had. Uh, uh, really, the organization that showed, I think, that best showed how science could beat the dark forces of mysticism. He is now the general manager of the Chicago Cubs, Jed Hoyer. <laughs> yes, there were the dark ages of baseball before there was the breakthrough. Our next GM um, is the general manager of an organization that's considered to be the modern prototype of sports organizations. He's built a perennial powerhouse in Texas. From the Texas Rangers, the GM of a team that won back-to-back -back American League championships, John Daniels. All right, Rick, let me start with you. And uh, you guys can all answer this in, um, in the way that makes sense, because I know maybe everybody does things differently. But since we have the group that we have, Rick, how, how, let's start with this. How, what's the size and the scope of your analytics department? Whatever that department, if it's separate, if it's not separate, describe it to us. How large is it? You know, it is uh, something that actually Kenny Williams set up with one of his first moves was promoting Dan Fabian, uh, who was a longtime baseball operations assistant in our department. Uh, to head up our analytics department and made him the head essentially of objective analysis for the club back in 01. And under Fabes, we've sort of expanded both internally with a few young guys, I'd say two or three internally who work on it, and then uh, through a number of partnerships with some of the names on that banner behind us, as well as a few outside consultants who uh, we tend to keep a little bit on the back burner. So I think traditionally, certainly at least uh, for the early part of Kenny's tenure, uh, we were perceived as not uh, emphasizing objective analysis very much, which quite frankly uh, is a perception that I like and would prefer uh, to continue uh, and, and made me reluctant to accept this invitation today. I think it, uh, it allows us to uh, move a little more stealthily as we try to make certain acquisitions. I remember when we made the trade for Carlos Quinton uh, several years ago, uh, one of the more well-known uh, objective analyst blogs on, on the internet wrote, the, the White Sox broke with tradition today and went out and acquired a young, uh, potentially high OBP, high power impact hitter. As if, you know, we don't like chocolate and puppy dogs and Christmas like everybody else. <laughs> but that's okay, because if we had been, we've had other instances where our scent has been picked up on certain acquisitions that made those acquisitions more difficult. Mm -hmm. So while we tend not to uh, 
hold press conferences or spend a lot of time talking about the objective side of our operations. That's kind of on purpose. And going back to the start of Kenny's tenure, uh, it's been essential in all our decisions. How many guys, no, not counting again, yeah, you have other branches, but how many guys do you have? Uh, I would say a pro, we've probably got around five internally that are spending time. That, I've got full yeah. time on that. Jed, what about you? Yeah, I'm disappointed to hear that, Rick. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually amazing how much those departments have grown. You know, when, uh, when we started in Boston, uh, we hired Tom Tippett from Diamond Mind to really uh, create Carmine, which I know has received a lot of notoriety as the, the, the database there. And that was a one-person operation, and I think we were one of the first teams to really have a full-time person, you know, working on a database, being an analyst. Um, you know, right now we're in the process of building our department. Um, I think when all said and done, it'll probably be about a half dozen people, um, not including you know some outside consultants and things like that. But you know, it's uh, it's the amount of information has really exploded. Uh, I think especially with all the you know, the FX stuff, uh, the amount of uh, the research we need has really changed. So the idea of having a, being at the cutting edge with a one person department or one and a half person department in 2003, you know, now all of a sudden we're sitting here in 2013, you know, actively building up a department, you know, to keep up with teams that have, you know, six to 10 people working there full time. Okay. And I mean, you have the, I guess, is it an advantage to start from the ground up where you come in and say, okay, we, now we can build as opposed to you get into a place where you're augmenting? Um, I wouldn't say it's an advantage. I mean, wish it was all set up, the six people, and you walk in and it was ready to go. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there are some advantages. You get to hire the, the, you know, the people you really trust. You get to bring in um, you know, a lot of people. And uh, it's amazing. You know, right now, we're in the process of hiring for a, a director of R&D um, with the Cubs. And uh, the number of incredible resumes we, we've gotten is just, just remarkable. And, You're going to uh, get a few more in the next <laughs> hour, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Jay Foyer at Cubs.com. I think most of the people probably have applied. Um, <laughs> But it, it's just remarkable, you know, the, the quality of the research we've gotten, um, kind of free research just by, by posting a job, uh, the quality of the resumes, uh, it's remarkable. So, um, I mean, this is uh, uh, certainly an area of the game that's just exploded uh, exponentially in 10 years. John, what about you? Are you actually hiring for that or is that just free labor? Free labor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think people will be surprised. We don't actually have a formal analytics department. I think, you know, based on the, the perception of, you know, the backgrounds of, of us and some others, I think people, that people expect to have that. We probably have about six or eight guys that all have formal functions, whether it's on development, pro scouting, amateur scouting, uh, on the video department downstairs, but all of which, uh, you know, involve uh, objective analysis into, the, into their jobs. And so we'll have different times. We've got a couple guys here today from Matt Vanola and Matt Kalachi that, that are you know, two of those guys that have other formal responsibilities. Um, but we, don't, we actually don't have anybody that's, that's wholly dedicated to it. And we've talked about it, um, and I think we'll probably head to that direction, but uh, it, you know, we want it to be kind of organic when we do it. That's pretty surprising. So is yeah, it just I, you figuring these things out? I'm ordered, no, I mean, all everybody we, has it we, part of it? Don't be modest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that kinda, good, <laughs> fine. I am good with it. No, it's, it's a little bit of everybody looks at, everybody looks at these things. Uh, I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of guys you know, look at it, and, and what we want to kind of encourage is, is people to you know, think outside the box and do, you know, do what they're interested in. And, um, and so we, do, you know, we have one guy that uh, kind of came through our IT department that is in charge of putting our database together, and he works with everybody else to make sure they have the information they need. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's nobody whose full-time job it is exclusively analytics. All right, let me ask you this, and I'll follow up this way. Uh, when you had you Darvish, how, um, how hard did you work at trying to get an equivalency? Beyond that, oh, he's tall, he's got big shoulders, boy, look at his numbers in Japan. But how hard did you yeah. work at actually trying to figure out this is what he'll do? We, we did do some of that. I mean, it's just, it's so hard. I mean, just to, to really, to base a hundred million dollar decision on, on one number, no matter how much research and work you, you do into it. I think the bigger the decision, the, the bigger the, the resource or assets you gotta put behind a decision, whether it's, it's a trade or, or free agency dollars, you know, the more information that you need. And so for a waiver claim or you know, maybe a small free agent or minor, you know, we'll, a scout likes them, but the, the numbers are horrible, we'll go, we'll go with it. If vice versa, if the, the objective analysis says, hey, this guy's a lot better and we have non-prospect type status on him from the scouts, we'll go with it. 
for a hundred million dollar investment, we've got to go before ownership, and it's got to be a lot more than you know. This is major league equivalency. So we did do some of that work, but we also had twelve different guys see him. We saw forty of his starts. We watched all of his starts on video. Um, we you met, saw forty in person. Your, not your, me personally. Your people. I saw yeah, one, yeah. but yeah, but we had right. our people saw forty of his starts live. Because I mean, he was you know you can go back to two thousand six, and he was a a name, a guy that was that was going to be coming and. And to find upper rotation starters in the mid twenties is, is still challenging. I mean, it mm -hmm. just about never happens. So we we put we started putting that work in a few years earlier. Interesting. All right, Jed. How many? Uh, and everybody jump in on this, but how many like hardcore math guys do you have, if if any? And how important is that, or unimportant is that? I mean, someone who's really with a hardcore math, math not even an economics background, but a true math background. Uh, we have, uh, I'd say, one full time, and then we have a number of consultants that we use, uh, and that, and that's really the biggest challenge, uh, you know, I find is that, you know, obviously, um, you know, I sort of grew up with sabermetrics. You grow up, you know, analyzing stats, but I mean, there's a, a limit to my mathematical ability, mm -hmm. and you know, we have to hire people a lot smarter than us to be able to do, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the analysis. So, uh, right now, uh, you know, one plus plus consultants, and you know, that's probably an area that will grow. Um, but especially, as I mentioned before, with all the uh, you know, pitch effects, hit effects, field effects, um, I, I can understand that stuff. The guys you know, that I work with can understand it, uh, but we don't have the mathematical ability um, to do a lot of the, a lot of the research. And, and so I do think that you know, hardcore mathematical ability is becoming more and more important you know, with this, the, the exploding amount of information we have. Rick? We're, we're similar to that. The, the guys internally have a facility with it and are able to ask the right questions, but we got it for the for the hardcore math we go outside okay john pretty much the same thing i mean matt and matt can't really add so you know we uh, <laughs> uh they're kind of more there for their looks uh you know we, the one guy that's building the, the database has you know pretty uh, high-end uh, mathematical ability um everybody can you know can handle it on a, to a certain level but we do have to go you know, outside uh, for the extreme end we don't have anybody that's you know, that we lock in the back room and you know, pump out information. <laughs> I, I wonder too, because with all the guys that I talk to and all the different things, I'm sure everybody, when you read different things and you see things and you're like, okay, that's great. What does this mean? What do I do with it? What are the challenges, Jed, on that when you have someone who, who is right, far beyond your ability mathematically, but how do you translate to that something, something tangible that you can do? I think you have to ask a lot of questions. And, and, and Rick even mentioned, I mean, I think we, we all have enough ability with that to ask the right questions and, and to get to those answers. Um, and I think you just have to, you know, pound away at a, at a certain formula until you really feel comfortable with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, proprietary things we've attempted to come up with, and we just never became comfortable. And to me, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to use a proprietary number, if you're going to be comfortable with comfortable with that number, you have to be able to use it all the time. You have to be able to, you know, make that a, a key part of your evaluation. And if you don't feel comfortable with the inputs or don't feel comfortable with, that, with, the, uh, with the formula, then you're never going to do that. So I think we have to ask enough questions and, and dig down deep enough so it becomes something that we just trust intuitively. Like, this is a number that we trust. We know where it comes from. We trust the person that put it together. And we go forward. And I think if you can't do that, in some ways it just becomes noise. Because if you don't trust the number, then, then why is it part of your database? Mm -hmm. Rick? Similar to what Jed said, I think one of the challenges is we don't want I don't want to get a report on my desk from someone, as John said, from a back room saying, here's what the numbers say. We want the numbers to be part of the entire conversation with our scouts, with our coaching staff, uh, and all the decision makers in the room. So one of the challenges is being able to translate what the number says into a way that's accessible for everybody in the room. So we try at times to translate it to runs or translate it to an index where you go from 100 and up is better and below 100 is bad, you know, similar to ERA plus or something like that, uh, so that they can be part of the entire conversation. It's not just, well, here's the report I got and it says these three, here's the order we should go get these guys. I want them in the room advocating for their guys in a way that they can be rebutted and challenged. Mm -hmm. How about you, John? I think Rick hit it head on. I think that's kind of the approach we've taken while we want, you know, it's, it's part of their jobs, but not a, the only part of the, jo the guys' jobs. And so when we get a report on a player, it's, it, factors in, it factors in everything. And, you know, when our, our pro scouting department will put together, hey, here's, you know, here's the report on the guy, it's, I assume, I, I take for granted that they've already run it through those filters, the analytic filters, but they've also already talked to our scouts. Are you guys seeing this? If not, why? Are you seeing this guy make adjustments, changes? Has he matured? Have we talked to people around him? 
you know, is there a reason that we're seeing some improvement or, or, or decrease in, in his performance? And I think the challenge for us and, and any of the decision makers is you, know, you then have to not just translate it from you know, the paper to making a decision, but from the decision to the, to the field staff and the guys that are going to you know, put these players in position to succeed and so they understand, hey, what are the strengths? How did we come to this decision? Uh, for me, that's probably one of the bigger challenges. Um, you led me right to something else. I was going to go somewhere, but let's go there. Um, translating this to the field, everybody knows who your managers are. Um, how does that work, and how effective do you think your organization is in all your ideas that you have, your organizational philosophy, and then the guy in the dugout and the coaching staff implementing that? You know, we, we actually use a lot of it in our, in our advanced uh, uh, scouting reports. Um, does Ron get a, does he get like a packet, or how does that work? Yeah, exactly? yeah, we, we've got uh, three different guys that go ahead and put our advanced scouting reports together. We do it differently over the course of the year. Um, you know, for most of the season, we just do it off video, uh, you know, and uh, so we don't actually have somebody out on the road uh, following these guys you know, the way that these uh, a bunch of different um, uh, uh, vendors that, you know, by video and by, by data broken down, and then we can analyze it in-house, both visually and also on the back end. Uh, so then they, they put together a, a comprehensive report. And, uh, and our staff knows a lot of these players. I mean, we've, you know, they've been competing against them for a period of time, so we have some track record with it. And then every series we'll have a meeting with the staff, with the advanced scouts that have put all the information together, that are looking at it both ways. Um, so it's, you know, it's both looking at the video and saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm noticing these kind of trends. Mike Maddox does a ton of video work himself, breaking down hitters, kind of breaking down swings. And then also the back, the back side of, you know, the, uh, his the percentage that he swings in the zone, out of the zone, different counts, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and so, the challenge then for our advanced scouts is to boil that down. So, you, I mean, you'll have a you know, sheet of paper with, you know, just uh, too much information on it. It's his job to say, hey, here are the three or four things that we need to focus on, you know, mm -hmm. with these guys. Communicate that to the staff, and then the staff then takes those three or four things into a meeting with the players and, and delivers that. And how effective do you think that is? How good are they in implementing that, your ideas? I think pretty good. I, you know, I, I think one thing that you, you've got to realize putting those reports together is that, you know, it's not the gospel. It's not a guarantee, you know, and, uh, and guys are constantly making adjustments. So, I mean, there are certain things that, you, you know, certain, uh, you know, very basic um, uh, platoons and matchups that are you know, readily available to everybody that, you know, you, hey, you want to turn this guy around or you want, you know, things are very, I think we're, you know, we're great at those things. I think there's still a, a you know, some level of skepticism on, on some of the, you know, a little more finer, finer print, um, right. and like yeah. anything, and let, once they see it in play and see it work, you know, they're more accepting of it. Right. You know, I don't think you guys have to answer that question. You answered it so well. I don't think you have to answer that, so you're off the hook on that. But Thanks, uh, you had Ozzy Guillen, and now Robin <laughs> Ventura. Tell us about then, because I found to just to throw in when I'm talking to, and I work with Buck Showalter a number of years, and now work with Larry Boa, and every manager will just be instead they don't they don't put up a wall on the analytics. They just want more context. So I don't think those guys, I think there's a, a kind of that misconception of, uh, you know, that hey, don't tell me what I don't need to know. It's like, no, well, how many outs are there? Who's on deck? Who's on deck after that? How many pinch hitters are left? But how, now going through Ozzy Guillen and now Robin Ventura, tell us anything about that process. I don't think they're very different at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, they, this, this will come as a great shock to people in the room, but Ozzy was always open for a good debate and a mm -hmm. good argument. Uh, well, that we know. Yeah. Big surprise, yeah. I know. <laughs> so when you would bring information to Ozzy that, for lack of a better description, is strictly numbers based, he wouldn't just turn around and toss it away. He would sit down and he would extensively engage and challenge you on these numbers. Mm -hmm. He might not agree with them. Odds are he wasn't going to. But he would at least engage in the debate and conceivably work some of that in to his decision making. We saw it over the years, the way he would deploy guys or certain defensive things he did. He, he would use it. Uh, Robin, his approach is obviously quite different, uh, but is extraordinarily open-minded. We are really fortunate to have Robin and, and Don Cooper and Mark Parent and Jeff Manto, uh, as well as Super Joe McEwing, uh, who are not only open for debate, but they want the information and push for more information. They, they want to know why we're setting something up a certain way, and they will tell you that they, when they disagree and when they want different or more information. Again, it, it, part of what 
each of us, I'm sure, try to foster within the organization is not only that open debate, but the respect for what an individual brings to the table. Just as if in a certain game situation, Robin goes against what the numbers are, but it's what his gut told him to do, or what, based on what he knows from a health standpoint or what he sees in a player's eye, we have to give him the latitude to do that. That's his job. Now, we may have a discussion about it afterwards, and we're going to want to know the rationale, but he needs the latitude to do that. Just as when we bring something from an objective analysis side to the table, he understands that that individual has a job to do and needs the latitude to make the case and make the argument. So uh, I, I really like where we are right now. And I, I don't think uh, we were too far away from this with Ozzy because he was open to that kind of debate, too. So Jedna, you went through the, uh, the, from the Grady Little years uh, to where you can handpick your own guy. Uh, what, what are the, is, is, has there been what I think what I would see as kind of a, a real shift in what a modern manager is? Tell us about that. Uh, I think so a little bit, but at the same time, I, I do feel like, you know, from Grady Little, you know, to Tito, now work with, with Bud Black uh, in San Diego, and now Dale, um, I think it's really our job to, to do a good job of filtering the information. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, JD alluded to it. I think if you just provide them an unlimited amount of information and say run with it, it becomes overwhelming. I think we have to do a good job of you know, here are the five points on this series that we want to make. Um, and, and that way they have a chance to do that. Because the, I think if, if you overload a manager or if <clears throat> the players see that um, the front office is down there. The front office is kind of uh, pulling on the puppet strings. Uh, now all of a sudden that manager's undermined with the 25 guys and the coaching staff that he needs to lead. And it's our job to make sure that we can empower the manager. You know, here are the things that are important in the series. Here are the things that our advanced scouts saw. Here's what the, um, you know, here's what the, the data says. And then go manage the game. And I always use the example of, you know, Theo and I have probably watched, you know, 1,500 games together. And we disagree all the time. We'll sit there and argue about a pitching move up in the suite. And, all I care about as a GM is that when I go down and talk to Dale or Bud Black after the game, that they have a reason they did it. You know, they have a real rationale. I didn't like that matchup or, mm -hmm. you know, so-and-so was sore today. That's why I didn't, I didn't do it. I mean, I think that's, all, that's what we all want is that a well-thought-out, intelligent reason for a decision because we're not always going to agree. I mean, Theo and I disagree constantly. We have the same information, but we come to the decision differently every night. Is there a better way of doing it? Like, again, this goes back to the 1870s when you had one man who was the skipper and he did, should you have a, this comes up because I talked to, it was Bill Guyvet of the, the Rockies and, um, you know, for some reason it's controversial among players to have, the GM has an office in, in the clubhouse, at least he did last year. And I thought, why wouldn't you want help? There's so much a manager has to do. Is this um, kind of an outdated mode where it's one man leading the charge? Should it be a whole group? Of, it's a hard job, right? Could there be more people? It's an extraordinarily difficult job. And, and I think you've even seen in recent years with the clubs adding a second hitting coach, uh, the fact that there is a need for more support in certain areas. And as Jed alluded to, as, as sort of the outside analytics gets introduced with the scouting report and the video, you are providing them with a ton of information, uh, which if you don't boil down, is going to overwhelm them and, and, and paralyze them because there's, there's arguments, as with the decisions we make on a given day, there's arguments every which direction. So you have to help prioritize. Uh, in terms of is it outdated, the, the, the model of having a manager with the authority in game? I, for me, no. Uh, it, it works and you need someone. Uh, the job isn't just 7 to 10 each night as important, and a lot of Ozzy's strengths, in fact, were from 10 to 7 after the game was over until the next game in terms of communication and, and having guys know their role and, and preparing the team for that game. Uh, and for, to add multiple voices to that, I think, makes things difficult. I like our bench coach or our pitching coach debating with Robin during the game about a specific decision. That is something that's there that's necessary, given the volumes of information. Uh, but to then have different voices introduced throughout the day, I, I, I personally, maybe it's outdated or maybe it's old school, but I personally like having that singular voice leading the ship. Guys? I, I tend to agree with, with Rick there. I think one thing, I, I started as a fan, and I think you know, we all love to debate the managerial moves, and just like you know, Jed's saying, we're sitting up there in the suite or the stands or just, you know, cursing under our breath, sometimes <laughs> over our breath, and, you know, I mean, same, the same type of things, debating, debating the moves. 
think what we miss is it's an incredibly hard job like being a, a manager. I mean, these well, are that's all, what I mean. Should, should that guy have two or three people behind him with the books or set, making it, you know, those you know, decisions much better? I think you can go about it a different way. What we've tried to do is take some of the peripheral stuff off the, off the plate. You know, like, so like what? The medical, uh, you know, the, the medical staff and having the manager basically, people don't really give two full press conferences every day, mm -hmm. before and after. Plus they manage that, plus they're, they're constantly traveling, plus they've got their family situation and, and obviously the in-game. And I think anything, what we've tried to do is take away some of the, some of the extra stuff, the, the medical staff, the strength and condition. He still, he still is there day to day, but as far as like running the rehabs and running all this, we've tried to take a lot of that stuff. And, I, and we're not unique, I think pretty much everybody has. You know, done a lot of those things, but take a lot of those things off of, off of his plate. As far as having a you know a group of people behind it, I think you, for me that depends on who those people are, who's choosing those guys. That, that what I do, what we don't want is a is group think. You know, we don't because we're not. I mean, as Jed will say, you're sitting there saying, I can't believe he's making this move, and then you know that guy get you know he gets the punch out or he gets the hit or whatever you want. You're like, well, oh, great move. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and so you know we don't know. I mean, we. You, you know, the percentages are so are so fine uh, in between the right move and the wrong move, um, and I think that's what people were probably surprised. I know they were, but in Texas, when you know, I, when I heard Wash originally in, in 2007, because we're such, you know such different people, different backgrounds, different way of looking at the game, that's what that's what drew me to him. Kind of like what Rick's saying that uh, with Ozzy, that 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 dynamic personality that uh, has a. It's not just those three hours. You know, it's it's the rest of the day. You know, motivating men, getting them to understand you know their roles and and uh, there has to be the ability to synthesize the, the information given down. I think it's on us to make sure that that information is usable. Yeah, let me re-ask re the question then. What's the manager of the future then, Jed? 30 years from now, 40 years from now, wh who's, who's running the club day to day down, down below and how? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question. I think one of the, one of the trends we've seen, um, I think you know with with Robin. I know that the Diamondbacks tried it with, with AJ Hinch. I think some of the other uh, candidates for jobs have been just off the field, fairly young. I mean, guys like Brad Austin has been interviewed. Mike Lowell has been rumored. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's if that's part of the future. You know, I think that um, as the money has exploded in the game, uh, I think some of these guys that made fifty, sixty million dollars, they may really want to manage or be a bench coach for a major league team. They might not want to ride the buses in the South Atlantic League for, you know, for the whole summer. Um, so I think you, I think you may see some some guys that are, you know, more more recently off the field, a little bit younger, uh, become managers. I know for, in some ways, the three three of us are a good example. You know, I think fifteen years ago, uh, GMs were were much older. That, you know, that shifted a little bit younger. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw the manager job shift a little bit younger. Um, Closer to you know former players, but not quite as far removed, and maybe not with the the same length of minor league managing experience in the past. We um, we had Jerry Depoto on uh, yesterday in this conference. I, the one thing that made my head you know perk up was he said the most important part of my day uh, of my job is managing risk. That's how that's his mindset going through, and you guys are nodding. What what is the most important part of your job? Like, what would, what could you tell us? What on a on a minute to minute, hour to hour basis? What what is the biggest part of your job? Yeah, I, I probably look at it a little more simple, kind of managerial uh, side of what we do. I think it's you know, hire the best possible people and let them do their jobs. You know, make sure they have a voice and a seat at the table. And uh, and are incorporated into the into the decisions. So it's more of administrative, and yeah, I, I think it's, that's it's, not a bad thing. By no, the way, I think I'm it's not leadership. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's team. It's it's creating a team and, and getting the most out of them. You hmm. know, whether that's on the field or off the field. For me, that's how I look at. It. Make sure we have the best possible people in place and uh, allow them to do their jobs. And that everything is moving, humming along on a on a daily basis. Sure. Jed, um, not to to parrot JD. I think our our you know, our most important job is to make sure our processes are are really good. You know, if we're gonna you know, go to ownership and rest, recommend they invest $100 million in a player, you know, we should be expected to pro provide, you know, a hell of a binder, you know, that's scattered, you know, with scattering reports, video, analytics. I mean, ultimately we're investing. And, uh, you know, I think that you can't invest well unless you have a great process. And so you, know, you can't develop those processes without great people, but I don't want to parrot what he said. So I really do think that, like, you know, making sure that whether it's, you know, how you, you know, scout in the draft, you know, how you do things in player development, how you do things medically, 
uh, making sure that you know when you go to bed at night, you know that the decision's been well made. Um, we're going to be wrong, and we're betting on human beings. Uh, there's no doubt that you know we're going to we're going to miss because of that. But to me, the misses are okay, and they they let you sleep at night if you know the process is really good. Uh, if the process was shoddy, uh, you cut corners or didn't hire the right people. I think that's what really keeps you up at night. Rick, what about you? I mean, obviously, what Jerry's saying is right because fundamentally. Our job is to try to forecast the future and allocate our resources based on risk and reward, whether it's in the amateur world, free agent, or contracts or whatever, uh, the best we can. But I do think that JD and, and, and Jed here took it to the, the right level, where you have to create the right environment with the right people and the right processes and facilitate the communication between everyone. So a lot of our job isn't necessarily making sure the trains run on time, but it's sort of what the assistant GM job was. Mm -hmm. for me at least, um, but it's about making sure that all the processes are working properly and there's no sort of hindrances along the way. I don't even, I'm trying to think of how to ask this question. I'm asking it the wrong way. Um, where's John Walsh Swatsky style? I'm going to make it a little more, um, you know, pointed, but is your job fun? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, is it? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, that, it really is. I mean, it's a, it's a dream job. Um, you know, kind of like the manager has the, I'm not saying this is the media, but how the manager has the, the things he has to do, the press conference before. There are a lot of things like that with our jobs that, you know, that you would, perfect world, you would choose not to, not to have to do on a regular basis that aren't, you know, the, the most enjoyable use of your time. But all in all, would I trade it? No. I mean, it was an unbelievable amount of fun. We get to, you know, basically, I mean, we all have hired people that we know and didn't know, but we all develop relationships with them. And you're basically you know, getting a chance to help run a baseball team with a bunch of your friends. It's a pretty good time. Mm. I, know, I mean, it, everyone thinks, wow, it's got to be great. But I, seeing the day to day, I'm thinking, are you aware of the pressures? Are you aware of, I, I can't even imagine the, the enormity of thinking of not just your major league club, because that must be fun. But then you got a whole, you know, all the other teams, all the other the people that are depending on you. I, I, just even hearing over the last day, uh, I don't think I think of all the minor league teams and everybody coming up through your system and all the reports that are coming through because I'm not living it day that's, to day. That's the best part. I'll tell you, I guarantee if, really? if there's a losing streak going on and you're not playing well, we're in you know Charlotte. Daytona or Hickory <laughs> or I mean, that's where you find out. That's a, that's, get down that's there. A, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's just pure baseball. And that's you know get away from it. Jed, is it fun? Uh, I mean, JD answered it really well. I always think you know no matter how bad things are going. Um, no matter what brush fires come up, I, mean, I can say in all honesty, like I can't wait to get to, to work in the morning. You know, it, it is fun. You know, you're, you're working with like-minded people on something that, you know, I, if I had a real job, I'd be sitting there, I would be, uh, you know, I'd be looking at stats in the morning. I'd be, you know, probably playing fantasy baseball. I mean, I, I grew up, I grew up, you know, uh, scoring, you know, doing a fantasy league when I was like 11 years old, like, you know, scoring it by hand. I, you know, played baseball through college. I mean, this is what I love to do. So for me, you know, the, as much hard work as it is, late nights, all those different things. I mean, it's all what I'd be, I'd love to do. So, I mean, I feel really fortunate. Um, do you still play fantasy baseball? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I probably would want to be in a league with you, but I'd be yeah. interested to know your decisions in yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it, it's who are your sleepers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't complain. We have a, we have a great job. It, it can be stressful and difficult at times, but it's what we want to do. Uh, Rick, what about you? I mean, that, that's. Fundamentally the thing, we, we are all very fortunate to be in the situation we're in. Uh, is there stress? Yeah. Is there even more stress than I anticipated over the last five months than there was in the previous 12 years? Absolutely. Uh, and their time, it, every so often I at least take a step back and realize that my time in this chair is going to be short, whether it's one year or 10 or 15 or whatever. Uh, it's only going to be a brief period in time. And if we can't enjoy this opportunity, this unique opportunity that many of us aspired to since we were you know, teenagers or earlier, uh, then we're doing it wrong. So while we certainly, I don't think any of us, or I'm guessing none of us, uh, enjoy the wins as much as the losses hurt, which would be the one thing I'd love to try to find a way to correct in terms of my own internal balance, uh, we're extremely fortunate to, to be able to do this. Oh, good. I'm glad you're having fun. I, w I would hope. I would just wonder. It's almost like when you're describing the manager. Anytime I, I you know, personally know a manager and I kind of walk through their day, I'm amazed at how you know, difficult it's got to be. Just seeing, suddenly seeing the press from the other side, fans, 
without even getting into blogs and everything else. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Do you guys have a lot of questions? Are you, because uh, I could do this all day. I have one last question, then we'll get, but everybody get, get warmed up and, and start to think. Rick, let me start yes. with you. Give me, um, instead of asking who's the, B, uh, excluding the people on this panel, who's the best GM in the game, give me a GM that you think is really, really good. Oh boy, there, there are really a, a ton of them. It sort of depends on, everyone has a different situation they're dealing with. Uh, what Terry Ryan does in Minnesota, given their resources, uh, is extraordinarily impressive, as is Andrew Friedman, although his approach obviously is very different from, from, from Terry's, or at least perceived to be very different from Terry's. Uh, given Billy's track record of success and, and the way he has sort of mainstreamed and popularized a lot of the things that other offices were doing, uh, he deserves a world of credit and admiration. And it, it, I think for us, in our situation, we try to take the best from our competitors and improve, make them our own and try to improve them the best we can. Uh, I'm replacing the guy who arguably was the most successful GM in White Sox history. And there's a lot of what Kenny did and how he approached things that we're going to continue and have continued and, and obviously I admired. At the same time, if we can add a little bit of Terry Ryan, a little bit of Andrew Friedman, uh, we'll be that much better. Okay. Jed, who's really good out there? Uh, well, I think that, um, I mean, Rick's right that you, that you have to take every, everyone in, in context for what they're trying to do, they're building, are they trying to win now? Um, but I always think it's important, you know, uh, let's say my leanings might be, I might be more similar in my thought process to, say, Andrew. I think Andrew is fantastic. But at the same time, you know, I look at you know what Brian Sabian's done in, in San Francisco. I look at what you know Walt Jockey's done in Cincinnati, and you know it might they might not use the exact same style that I would have, but they've been wildly successful. And I think you always have to remember, you know, there is more than one way to skin a cat in this job. And if you only have one leaning, and if you only uh, focus on one group of people or one thought process, I think you're really shortchanging yourself. So I always try to think, okay. That's not a move I would have made, but let's try to dig inside and, and see why this guy, who's been very successful, you know, made that move. So um, I think there's a lot of ways to do the job. I think there's a lot of people that do it very well. Um, and I think it's a mistake if you just focus on how one person might do it, as opposed to you know, other people that, that do it a different way very well. Mm -hmm. John, who's really good out there? Um, these guys give such good like, political answers. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they tried to name yeah. every GM. Is yeah. what they tried. Yeah. They just couldn't come up with every one of them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was thinking about Andrew, but I don't want to get back to him, get to his head. So I'll, I'll get him <laughs> the guy that I, I think was, you know, obviously he's in the Hall of Fame. Like two years ago, Pat Gillick was. Mm -hmm. I think he was like, you know, rightfully so, in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you look at what he's done. Does it from like every different level you know what I mean by that is he you know scouting and development base with the Yankees then goes to Toronto from an, an expansion team builds them up to you know best team in baseball in the late 80s early 90s you know wins two World Series goes to the Orioles builds them up they go to the I think playoffs for three or four years that he's there uh, and then goes to Seattle and it's a completely different way and you know after the after Alex, Randy, and, and Griffey are out and rebuilds that team, goes and gets each row, 116 wins, mm -hmm. and then goes to Philadelphia and wins the World Series again. I mean, if you, you look at like the different markets, different ownership groups, different challenges that he took on, and one with the, the one common denominator, which you, you constantly hear about him, is how well he built the organization, the types of people he brought in. He didn't clean, uh, clean house in any of those situations, mm -hmm. but he got the best out of his people, treated them really well, and obviously the results are there. How about now? Since you went on a retire, since you ripped yeah. those guys, and then you yeah, went with a exactly. retired, retired guy. Yeah, you go to a retired guy. Yeah, hall of famer. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you think of Sherholtz? Was he good? Branch Rickey was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I, I think one guy that doesn't get enough credit is uh, is I can't pronounce his last name, but Mo in St. Louis. Uh, John, I think it's Mozeliak or Moseliak. Or, um, I think you know. I think Mo does a great. He's very understated, but you know they. they um, I think he learned a lot from a lot of good people, and has continued continued that on. And I mean, they've got a ton of depth. They have a good big league club. You, know, you talk to their people; they like working there. They think outside the box, but yet they don't ruffle feathers. And they do a hell of a job. Good. First of all, before we get questions, let's hear it for these guys right here. Pretty good. It, uh, it's, just, it's great hearing the different uh, methods, the different styles that you have, and appreciate the candor, given that, you know, what you might get back to you and that sort of thing, <laughs> talking to the, uh, the thinking fans that are here, this, uh, the, uh, the elite, enlightened groups. All right, let's start with some questions. John. Uh, yeah, John Walsh from ESPN. Um, 
what website, um, what publications, what references or thinkers influence you that you've learned from? I'll run down like my morning list of websites that we hit. I mean, we, uh, I mean, it's everything. It's ESPN, MLB Trade Rumors, you know, Sports Illustrated, CBS, Fangraphs, Roto World. I mean, you know, our own, uh, our own MLB.com. I mean, I try to hit a little bit of everything. Um, you know, there's no. I don't know that I have like one guy that I look at as, or one or two minds. I, I really like everything, whether what it's kind a. Of information you look for that could I'm, mostly what I'm looking for at that, that time is I'm looking for opportunities. You know, I want to know what's going I want to keep up with what other teams are thinking, injuries, needs. Um, and we've, you know, a lot of other guys that are, I think are looking more at some of the information and, and uh, how that we can incorporate that into our thinking. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of what John said. Um, I try to go to other teams' blogs and try to cruise around a little bit if we're talking about a deal or there's a, a player I'm interested in because it's amazing how much good information is out there and how many thoughtful fans there are. I mean, there's a lot of fans that post, you know, reactionary things after <laughs> games, but there's a lot of really thoughtful analysis that team that, that I mean, no one knows a, a, a team like the team's fans. And if you go to their, their most rabid fans and read blogs, they can be pretty helpful. Um, you know, a lot of what a lot of what John said, you know, I go to try to go to fan graphs and hardball times and, and baseball prospectus and I sort of, that's sort of my morning routine. I read game reports from the minor leagues and I cruise around those websites to see what's going on and then kind of start the management part of the job. But, um, you know, that is one of the fun parts is, is going through that information and, and uh, I feel like it, it's our job to stay current. And, you know, those are the, the best websites to do that. And they've obviously already hit on the big ones with Fangraph and Prospectus are sort of the two uh, main ones that we hit every day. But I also echo what Jed said. Uh, there's actually a, a very fine uh, White Sox fan blog called Southside Sox that I see every day and I, I like maybe not additional information because obviously their information is incomplete, but I like to see how they approach our decisions and I analyze sort of uh, where we're going and how, not just how it's playing so to speak, but more what is an outsider's point of view from someone who clearly wants what's best for the organization. So th there is a real role for, for fan blogs, for lack of a better description. And you don't have to look at Ozzy's Twitter page anymore, right? So, uh, <laughs> we got not required reading. <laughs> Todd. Hi, Todd Leibowitz with the Sabre Board of Directors. Can each of you give an example of where analytics or data has not just influenced a decision, but has actually caused you to change course, whether it's at the micro level of, of managing a game or strategy, or at the macro level of how you might build your team or, or a player you might pursue or release? Probably the two that immediately jump to mind, and they're both a little stale at this point. Uh, we signed Esteban Loaiza to a minor league deal uh, late in, the, after I want to say the 2003 season. Uh, and obviously he turned out to be fantastic for us and came in second for the Cy Young in, when he made that club in 04, uh, or 03, it was 03, 04. Um, there was no magic number that we looked at that helped make that decision, but a lot of our uh, sort of similar to pitch FX analysis at that time about the addition of a cutter that he made late in the 2002 season, much less knowing what Don Cooper, our pitching coach, has historically done with guys who have cutters of strength, uh, helped facilitate that decision. Also on the 05 team, we, we moved, uh, we used Dustin Hermanson exclusively as a reliever instead of as a starter, which was the purpose when we signed him based on some of the uh, proprietary reliever work we had done and some of the analytics in his past. Um, and probably the best example I can use is, you know, in San Diego, um, it's such an obvious, uh, you know, the park factor is such an obvious thing to try to exploit. And I think that the natural thing to try to exploit is the fact that it's, you know, get fly ball pitchers and get fast outfielders. And, you know, I started to work a little bit counter to that. You know, the infield, you know, it gives up the fewest number of ground ball hits in baseball. And so looking at a lot of different analytics when it comes to, you know, how ground balls react there, you know, whether the heavy air might make the ball sink more. So you know, that's an example of, you know, um, really trying to spend time and do research on a, a particular area. And that was like, OK, let's, let's try to think counter to what the obvious thing is. And, and I think that um, you know, the Padres have had a lot of success with ground ball pitchers uh, in that ballpark. And that, doesn't, that isn't something that you would normally think uh, when you think about the Padres, you think fly balls, fast outfielders. And we tried to 
kind of run counter to that a little bit. I think one area that we've, two, two things. One that we've used it in is on like kind of our, our uh, medical and conditioning side and just trying to look at you know, different uh, individuals that have had different uh, histories, whether it's a shoulder program or a throwing program or, or whatever the case may be, and then taking, this, taking the best of those and applying it for a, a bigger group and studying that over time and seeing the, seeing the benefits of it. From an acquisition standpoint, is it, you know, relatively small acquisition is uh, Corey Burns, and we'll, you know, it's still to be determined see how it plays out. But and we had scouts that liked him with a good change up in the deception. But he was designated for assignment by San Diego, and he had really you know, some of our, our guys in the office like you know, his minor league uh, swing swing and miss rates and things like that. And so we took a chance on him. Okay. Where, how about right there? Um, one of the things. <coughs> you would then bring in and um, work with uh, scouting is what you generally discuss. And by, of course, scouts uh, will measure players on a numerical scale. Uh, first of all, it seems to me that that information, and some of you mentioned this at all, or, or also is, um, would be useful on the player development side through the minor leagues, but also medically, uh, if you're dealing with rehab, everyone's addressed this a little. What I'm curious about is when you're dealing with people, and Don Welke comes to mind. I've dealt with him. Apparently, he doesn't have an email account, because I've tried. <laughs> um, there are very capable people within organizations where if you are going to present them with a spreadsheet or a graph or a number, that they're not going to be receptive to it, and that seems like it might be a stumbling block. I'm curious as to how you make that translation such that you don't run into essentially a disconnect. A couple of things. First, I don't mind the disconnect. I want there to be that kind of debate in the room. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier we do try, though, before we get in the room, to have the objective side of things boiled down as simply as possible, again, on a runs or a wins or an index basis to help make it a little more accessible. I want our Don Wilkie equivalent, if he has a problem with what the numbers are saying, then we explain sort of what's behind the numbers, what goes into making this player, what skills does this player have or tools that have translated into this level of success that makes him attractive. And then you're speaking his language. Then you're talking about skills and tools and projection and what this player could potentially be. At no point is anyone, I don't think in any of our organizations, ramming down a number and telling the Don Wilkie type, nah, this is what it says. It's more feeding the debate and although coming at it from a different standard or a different perspective, ultimately we're all talking about the same thing, forecasting the future of player performance. And whether it's from a number or from a guy's eyes, ultimately we can all speak the same language, but it does take some level of translation. I was, one, one thing I think is um, important that we have dealt with in every organization is that um, I think you know the scouts um, they know that you know I have an analytical bent, you know, and that my bosses have, and that the worst thing you can do is is, is change their mindset. You're hire, hiring them for their eyes and their instincts, and you want them to go out and scout. You want to take you know, their report and you want to combine it with the numbers and if the numbers are influencing their report or they're, or they're saying something that you think they think you want to hear, then the report is, is tainted. So really trying to keep those things separate. You want, to, you want them to know how you're thinking and what you're thinking, but you want them to go out and scout with their eyes and their instincts and not worry about telling you what, you know, the numbers say because I can go on fan graphs, you know, I'm hiring that person to go out and, and watch the game and, and, and use, you know, their knowledge. I just echo what these guys said. I think you, you want that like difference of opinion. I mean, uh, you don't want to, as long as it's there's a respect factor in there. The other thing, you know, it's not. There's nobody that's. I think we make too much of the stat scout debate. There's nobody that's on 100% of either spectrum, right? I mean, either end of the spectrum. We're, we all, you know, people in this room will go to a game and be like, I like that. I like that. I like what I see, right? And the flip side, the the you know the grizzled. Veteran baseball guy that is you know ah you know not looking at the the number 
he goes back and he's looking through the media guy when nobody's looking and checking out like what the guy's done. And mm -hmm. so I think we make too much of that, and, and it's just about having like like Rick said in an earlier answer, as long as people respect each other's perspectives, and then uh, challenges for the decision makers to blend that information. Let's go way to the back, so don't just keep picking on the kids in the front. Yes. Uh, are there any types of data information you're not currently collecting that you would like to see that you think could help your club, even including things you might not think exist yet? Probably not that we're going to talk about in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Jed will share all his thoughts on yeah. that. I will <laughs> hopefully take notes. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, as the uh, field and hit FX data becomes more readily available, uh, it's going to lead to a lot of interesting inquiries and, and debate going forward. But I'm going to stop there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even hear. What, what, is it, what was the question? What, what data do we want that we don't have? We want us to bear our souls. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it doesn't seem that incendiary. They're very sensitive to that. Right. We are very sensitive. <laughs> is there a next wave of competitive advantage somewhere? I, I kind of touched on that yesterday, saying that the loopholes have closed, or is there? I've got a job if anybody knows what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think, of course, there is. I mean, there's, there's going to be a, a next thing. I mean, it's not like baseball is done evolving. So, of course, there's a next thing. I think the question is whether there's I think people may find out, um, I think that people may copycat or find out quicker. I think there was a time, I mean, certainly Billy with the A's, there was a pretty huge gap he had, an advantage he had on people um, until the rest of the league sort of caught up on, on what he was doing. I don't think that gap will be quite as long in the future. Until they wrote a book about it. Until they wrote a book about it, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's, of course, is the next thing. Yeah. There's, there's always going to be competition in terms of identifying uh, recruiting and retaining the best scouts and there's a way to use objective data to help facilitate that so uh, when you're dealing with the subjective side and the human side like that uh, there's not enough outstanding scouts for all 30 of us to be operating at our at our at our peak level of evaluation so uh, that may well be where you start seeing some more of this competition or differentiation is more on the subjective side uh, but analytics plays a role in that too, I think. I just want to, even like in football, right, where, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, it was, can't, you quarter, can't have a running quarterback, can't have a running quarterback <laughs> in this league, and now it's like, got to have a quarterback that runs in this league. You know, it's just, it, it will shift. I just don't know how it's going to shift in baseball. Who's got a question? Uh, yes. Dave Perrick, Padres season ticket holder. Question with, uh, good to see you again, Jed. <laughs> <laughs> You know this? Is this all right, Jed? Is yeah, there, good, you, want, you want I this think, guy out of here? I think we're good. <laughs> we, we liked him in San Diego. Okay, good. All right. With the, uh, like with the more educated fan, or the, at least the ability for fans to become more educated through the resources you mentioned in blogs, does it make your job harder because you have fans who know your 35th best prospect <laughs> and then you, not that you need to necessarily appease the fans, but you don't want them to necessarily riot because they are, they are paying the bills, so to speak. I, I think it's made all, I think it's universally made GMs a little bit more gun shy. And I think that, you know, you see fewer deals uh, now than I think you, you once did, uh, especially prospect deals, because you, fans have read about, uh, you know, the 35th best prospect. They certainly, um, any top prospect, they've already penciled into the lineup in three years, and that, that guy's going to be an all star. And that wasn't the case, you know, when I was growing up or you know, when we were, we were following it, you know, as a, Red Sox fan growing up, I think, you know, you, you knew about Trot Nixon because he was the seventh pick in the country, but you didn't know about all these other guys coming up through. And if they had traded one of them to get a reliever, it wouldn't have been a, a you know a huge story. So I think that's probably the biggest thing is it's probably made all 30 GMs more careful because the information about the prospects is so available. I need I need to de develop some sort of app that doesn't allow me to read the comments section. Then I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I think what it has done a little bit is, as Jed said, makes us gun shy, but from a standpoint of not wanting anything to leak out and be debated before it takes place. Uh, we like to be able to be the ones to advocate our case first. If you disagree with it or you don't like the reasoning, fine. Uh, you know, that's part of the, why this game's so robust is the difference of opinions. When something leaks out and we don't really have control of it at first, and the debate becomes how could they possibly give this guy up, or what, and then potentially you're you're souring the pot of your decision making or the the, the, the formula of what you, of your decision making. It's we're only human. You try to ignore it. You don't want to respond strictly to fan sentiment ever. Uh, see his new catcher. Uh, <laughs> 
But at the same time, uh, when it's out there before we can do something, it, it starts souring the pool. How about you, John? Yeah, not, a, not a lot to add to what these two guys said. I think the, the big thing, it, it's consistency. Consistency in your thought process, decision-making process, approach with the fans, and really like your plan. Where are you as a big league club? I, my guess is that you know, everybody's worst mistakes for the most part are when you know, they make a move that doesn't kind of fit with where they are, you know, and, you, and, and your vision, your plan, like, are we ready to win now? Are we, and it's okay to trade prospects against that, you know, obviously within, within reason versus, you know, hey, we're not ready to win, but we're, you know, we're still kind of intrigued by this deal and it doesn't really fit big picture. And so I think just that consistency and, and the plan and then, you know, with the fans communicating that, that you get away from that, that's usually when you get in trouble. Jed, does it actually work a little bit in your favor now where, again, the, the uh, educated fan is saying, no, uh, we, don't, we didn't expect you to win last year. You're building something. We don't see the results. So maybe, conversely, it's like, no, it's going to take a while for these guys to do this right. Oh, there's no question that uh, I, think, um, in, I think in all sports now, not just in, uh, in baseball, I think fans uh, understand you know, the building process of a team more. Uh, they're more in tune with a, a GM's decisions than they probably once were, um, you know, you know, Theo and I have talked a lot of this about being really transparent with the Cubs fans. This is what we're trying to build. This is how we're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'd love to we'd love to win this year, but realistically, we're, we're building for something that's supposed to be you know very special in the future. And so, you know, I'm not sure that message would have would have resonated 20, 25 years ago. I think now, you know, Cubs fans really want to have that consistent winner, and we've you know been really open with them about that. You know, we traded. You know, uh, a bunch of players last year, the deadline for, for young players, and I think everyone understood that was something that was going to happen, and it, it did result in a lot, in a really bad August and September, but there was an understanding. So I think the intelligence of the fans and the information out there really helps that process and allows you to do that much more now than you could in the past. We traded for his players, and we still had a bad September. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that, uh, that Jen, I think you, you told me, if I'm remembering it correctly, what you said you, there was a concern. Act, you know, yeah, you're doing all that, and it makes sense. It makes sense, but uh, it kind of showed me how close you are to the field and how close you guys are to the field. That you felt like down the stretch, wow, we could, we're coming apart. We've got to do something. That you know, that you didn't quite have enough pitching as much as you wanted down the stretch. How much do you feel like? We've, we've got to compete a little bit now, I mean, and do a little bit better. Yeah. I mean, there's a game every night, you know, and I think that uh, we understand what our, our long-term goal is, um, but at the same time, every night there's a game scheduled, and I can tell you after you know, made those trades last year in July, you know, there was nights in September, in, in August and September, where we, we just didn't have enough pitching to get through games, and we were actively trying to go out there and find pitching to get through games. And, you know, I also do believe, you know, in 2010 in, in San Diego, we weren't expected to win. Uh, and we were very successful. You know, the A's and Orioles last year. You know, this is a game that I, I do think that, you know, team gets off to a good start. Uh, it's remarkable how things can, can snowball in the right direction. Um, they start believing in each other. Uh, you get some surprise performances. The next thing you know, you're, you're competing. Um, and, you know, so you never want to give up on any one season. You never want to, uh, you know, in our, in our opinion at least, as you're rebuilding, always try to be, you know, Give, give your team a puncher's chance, give your, chance, your fans a chance to have a good season because you know, I don't think people in Baltimore or Oakland last year were expecting you know, a fantastic season and they, and they got one um, because those GMs you know, put pieces in place that allowed them that, that they could be successful if things really went the right direction. Allow me to follow up one second and then we'll get right to you. Do, how much does losing affect you? <laughs> it's not fun, a lot. I mean, I yeah, I think Jed, even when you're expecting to lose, like Jed was just saying, you know, it, it's brutal. You know, I mean, we, same thing for us, 2007, 2008. You know, we know you kind of knew going in that it, you probably didn't have the team that was going to do it, but you still want, you know, and we're, it's, a, it's still an entertainment business. You're still building a fan base. You're still building towards something, and it's, you know, that's I'm just on a personal level. I mean, it, you go home at night, you you win the game, you you watch whatever, you know, whether it's Sports Center or MLB Network, you you probably watch. You lose the game, I I don't usually watch it. You don't you don't want to see it again. You know, I mean, because of, that's how we compete. And I think it's human nature. Yeah, Rick, what about it down the stretch, like for you, where, I mean, what was it like, uh, and again, on a, on a human level going home, because you're so good all year, and then suddenly the losing, right. you know, streak happens, and then what is that like? No, it, it, it carries over. I mean, I, I do know very early on in my career, it, made, it became apparent to me I could not work in football. 
I, I couldn't wait seven days to try to get a bad loss out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate that usually the next day by four o'clock batting practice has started and you start you know, feeling the juices flowing for that night's game and a new opportunity at redemption. As for sort of the larger issue, not a singular game loss or a losing streak, uh, you know, being in first place for 120 or so days last year and then it falling apart down the stretch, that's, that's difficult. You carry that into the offseason. I watched very little of the postseason uh, because, you know, it, 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 I think Jed alluded to it earlier, or JD did, you know, I wanted to get to the fall league as quickly as possible in October, just because there you can focus on the future instead of the present. Uh, it, we do have jobs where you need to turn the page fairly quickly, so by middle of October there's some uh, A-ball six-year free agent that you're getting fired up about, and you're able to sort of refocus your energies on that. But it, it's, you know, it, it, there's a very real uh, human element to that that's difficult. Look, it, these games out here, for example, they kind of mean nothing, mm -hmm. even though we have a good winning record right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they kind of mean nothing. But we're sitting there for three hours, and we want to win. Yeah. You know, we, if we're going to be there that long, we're going to see our guys perform, we want to win. It's just the nature of sort of how we're wired. Yeah. Jed, you want to just add something on that? No, I mean, the same thing. I, I, there's, uh, even, even if you, know, you go into a game and, or go into a, a stretch and you're not expecting to win, I mean, the drive home after you lose is awful. You know, you're competitive and I think Rick said it perfectly. When you do anything for three hours, uh, you know, why not win? And mm -hmm. when, you, when you lose, it's, it's, it is difficult. I'm, I'm not you know, evolved enough being, I guess, to just <laughs> block it out completely and say, okay, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. And, and you think about it, you know, in this, in this game, if you win, you know, six out of ten nights, you're a fantastic team. Um, so I think we all should be better at it and we should all have better <laughs> perspective and we all talk about it, you know, when we're together. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't, you know, and we all, the wins feel good, but the losses are so much worse. And I think part of that is the nature of baseball. Um, we're trained to never get very high about a win or never get really excited about a winning streak because you know that the minute you feel good about yourself, the losing streak is, is right behind that. And so I think that mindset, it's horribly defeatist, I guess, but we, always, we, we, we carry that because you always think, don't get too high, don't get too excited. And so the wins aren't as fun as the, as the losses are hard. And that's, that's, that's not a great way to go through a season. Or life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems very unhealthy what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we all understand. Like, the managers get ulcers. I mean, they go into a death spiral when they're in a losing streak. But you guys are only one step from that and responsible for a lot more. Yes. Um, Sandy, work at Citigroup in New York. Jed, you mentioned money exploding in the game. And can you talk about, you know, you guys all have business backgrounds. Uh, you have a strategy and development group. Can you talk about innovation on the business side of your team and kind of what's your oversight there? how much involvement you have, and what are unique things that you're doing to help grow the fan base, TV network, stadium financings, and things like that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think any good, any good baseball organization, you know, the business side uh, and the baseball side are really going to work in concert. And, you know, ultimately, we spend money that they make, you know, and, you know, whether it's getting more fans into the gates, whether it's getting a better cable deal, whether it's getting more sponsorship dollars, I mean, you know, all that money is coming in so we can spend it on more players and you, you can't raise your payroll um, unless your owner is just going to back you with losses. You can't raise your payroll unless you bring in more money. So you know, I think in baseball there should be a great relationship to the baseball and business side and um, you know, the more that you know, our players can work with the community or, or, or foster that relationship the better because um, you know, like the cable deals and sponsorship, sponsorship dollars are, are going up so much right now that um, you know, if you don't have that kind of uh, cable network, if you don't have that kind of money, you're really being left behind. And uh, that's the nature of our game. So, um, you know, you, of course we're supportive of it and want, and want our teams to you know, raise the revenues as much as possible. Yeah, I don't think any of us have any direct oversight over, over the business sides. Um, I think, we, you know, like Jed alluded to, there's a relationship and uh, both figuratively and literally, I mean, there, there's, the relationship just in how we you know, the wins drive revenue and, and then we, we can spend it. Um, but that, for me, from our side, that's the only thing that really moves the needle. I mean, we've, you know, when we signed Darvish, we, there were a couple of small sponsorships that, but they weren't small, but in, against a hundred plus million dollar investment, we're still, you know, they didn't come close to paying for any of that. Um, and but the only thing that really moves the needle from our perspective is winning, you know, and, and I think. You know, we want to be fan friendly, get our guys out in the community, and, and, and that's, that's huge. But 
from on the baseball side, at the end of the day, the only thing that truly moves the needle from a revenue standpoint is winning. Was there any uh, thought within your organization to win? Because you've kind of won hearts and minds of Texas. Obviously, you're in football country. You've made real inroads there, really conquering that area. Was there a, was there a devised plan other than just, hey, let's build a powerhouse, which is nice, but anything beyond <laughs> no, I, that? I, well, I, I think from the business <laughs> side, I mean, we, you know, it was the, we really spruced up our ballpark. I mean, there's a lot of a huge capital investment into the facility, um, and, and we've done a lot to reach out to the community and you know from the business ownership Noel and everybody that I mean it's been a huge push um, so in my mind I think what that does I think that gives you the capacity that when when you do win you can maximize you know the the, uh, the benefits of it. Rick what about you? You know the uh, only thing I would add to what each of them said is our sales staff our both ticketing and marketing, corporate sponsorships, all that, they are actually a lot of our face to our fans. So when something happens, such as you know, JD signs AJ Przinsky, the next Monday I sit down with our entire sales staff and try to explain the rationale for why we did wind up with AJ. Because they're the ones ultimately, I can go on, I can speak to the Tribune or I can go on the radio and whoever hears me or reads it gets it. But the, our hardest core consumer is picking up the phone and calling someone in that business department. So that's why there's part of the reason for that communication is so essential, uh, not just because they're making the money we spend, and I agree with JD, ultimately wins is what's going to drive it, at least from my self-egomaniac standpoint. Uh, that's the most important part, but they have to have the message. They have to understand our thought process so they can communicate that to our most important consumers. Okay. Uh, great session. Uh, guys, we really appreciate your time coming out here and, and talking to everybody here. Let's hear Rick Hahn, Jed Hoyer, Sean Daniels.